Medical schools, just like any other university, have been doing a lot of crazy things lately, particularly over on the other side of the country at UCLA, where some students just came forward to report that they had to read an article related to fat phobia in healthcare as a part of their mandatory curriculum. Listen to this. Medical fat phobia isn't the result of providers not knowing some special cheat codes for working with fat patients. Providers didn't all miss the day in medical school where students were taught how not to be cruel to fat people. Fat phobia is medicine's status quo. With this lovely little illustration drawing of a morbidly obese patient... Of course, we had to play into racial stereotypes here with the white doctor yelling at the minority patient as well, because why else would you draw a cartoon like this? And they're looking at their doctor's office between two doors, lose weight or die. The person who wrote this article is named Marquiselli Mercedes, although they go by something else now. I happened to look up this name and this is... Mikey is the person who wrote this article. She, they pronouns. Did we expect anything different than what we're seeing here? Who calls herself, themselves, a fat liberationist writer, creator, educator, and doctoral student from the Bronx in New York at the School of Public Health at Brown University an Ivy League institution, and is broadly interested in how racism, anti-blackness, and anti-fatness shall shape healthcare research, promotion, and training. She also is the co-host of a podcast called Unsolicited Fatties Talk Back, on which we re-answer old advice columns from a fat liberationist perspective that realizes the multifaceted intersectional span of lived fat experiences. Oh boy. So back to whatever the UCLA students had to read, this PhD candidate at an Ivy League university is teaching all first-year medical students at UCLA how to embrace and live out fat liberation inside of the doctor's office. Of course, we can never, ever, ever begin to admit in 2024 or beyond that obesity is directly linked to every single major health problem from diabetes to cancer to problems with bone density to strokes and blood clots and everything else. No, we can't admit that because that would go against the approved narrative trademark patent pending. So instead, we write stuff like this to tell doctors they're not allowed to tell their patients that being fat is bad anymore. She writes, the first time I was penetrated, whoa, okay, I, I was 13, almost 14. The lights were on and bright. My gray sweatpants sat discarded on a chair with my stretched out underwear. My mom was a few feet away on the other side of a locked door. I... I have no words. Moments before it happened, I was asked in a few coded but unsubtle ways if I had ever had sex. I said no. I was reminded, in case I'd forgotten, that I was a developed girl and that developed girls often got certain kinds of attention, da 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 but I had not forgotten. It is impossible to be a young, fat, black girl and forget. My doctor a thin blonde woman, <gasps> how dare they, entered the room. She said hello with a big smile, but didn't tell me her name. She asked whether I was sexually active, but didn't seem satisfied with my answers. Then she told me to lay back, scoot my bottom toward the end of the table and spread my legs so she could take a look. She didn't explain what that meant or what she was doing or what she had done after it was over. I screamed for her to stop, shouted no over and over. The speculum, she's getting a pap smear for the record, had painfully snapped inside of me for a second time when she said, wow, you really weren't lying. I could only sob with so much helplessness, it made my throat rattle. When she finished, she said she would come back to discuss things with me, but she didn't. I was sent home with instructions to take Motrin and stay out of trouble. The STI tests all came back negative. Okay, so this is a 13-year-old going to the emergency room with extreme cramps suggesting some symptoms of an STI, a sexually transmitted illness. So the doctor naturally does what doctors are supposed to do and not always immediately trust the patient, but follow all of the symptoms to make sure that you can provide an accurate diagnosis. But this was racist, number one, and clearly was fat phobic because a pediatric emergency physician looked at her, a 13-year-old black girl, 
and was so certain I was sexually active that she performed a pelvic exam even when I revoked consent, if you can claim I ever gave it in the first place. Does this seem like an unfortunate aberration? Maybe a doctor who'd had a long night in the ER, a bad apple. You're not the first to cling to the comfort of denial. This is medical fat phobia. Medical fat phobia, according to she, they, refers to the specific ways that hatred and denigration of fatness manifest within medicine and the fields that medicine influences like public health. It is the reason many fat people likely didn't get or know how to have their COVID vaccine administered with an appropriate length needle and why the American Academy of Pediatrics supports bariatric surgery for fat kids despite the incredible risks. Mainstream writing on fat phobia usually gives into the myth that there is something exceptional about fat phobic violence in healthcare. But this is often just a way of scapegoating the fattest among us, the infinifat people who are only acceptable to acknowledge via mocking entertainment. <laughs> My gosh. So understanding this correctly, because I feel the need to reiterate this over and over and over again, there is no chance of losing weight. It's a hopeless endeavor. So you should never advise your patients to do that through surgery, through working out, through anything, because it doesn't matter. Ultimately, it's not going to be successful. You won't be able to reverse anything in your life and you're just going to die anyway from being fat. Medically inaccurate, like literal medical misinformation, period, full stop. Obesity is just a construct that we've invented along the way, just like we've invented constructs of race and heteronormativity and slavery, apparently. And therefore, obesity is really just a way for non-fat people, that's what we're now calling healthy and shape people, to discriminate against you in every area of your life. What? For those in the sciences and medicine, Mikey says, the conclusion that fatness is corrupt and corrupting is foregone. Gee, I wonder why. Discouraging critical thinking about how the scientific consciousness links fatness to death or disease to the detriment of fat patients. It is rare to find someone in these spaces who has taken any amount of time to question what they know about fatness. If you are the rare person who does, you are met with a blank stare and may even be shunned or discredited in the eyes of your peers and administrative supervisors. I wonder why doctors would be shunned and discredited for saying that fatness doesn't contribute to mortality of fat people, that obesity is something we should be fighting against. Instead, these people should be completely discredited and shamed everywhere inside of the scientific and medical communities for trying to say instead unconsciously linking fatness to death or disease that is the detriment of your fat patients how dare you try to actually help them if you insinuate that their condition might be causing a horrible reality for their life you are the problem i can't even make this stuff up anymore you guys the former dean of Harvard Medical School, the premier medical school historically in the United States, although we all know how Harvard has <laughs> over the last couple of months, Jeffrey Flyer has now come forward as one of the world's foremost experts medically on obesity and slammed this course, again, required for all first year medical students at UCLA to say that the curriculum promotes extensive and dangerous misinformation. Yeah, you can say that again. I don't know about you, but I don't really want any of my doctors believing that it is the discrimination of obesity that's causing all of the problems in society rather than obesity itself. Maybe we need some new medical school curriculum. California is losing it. But there are still good people in California and all around the country. And our friends over at Public Square, America's largest leading marketplace for small businesses that are all pro-family, pro-faith, and pro-freedom, and pro-actual science, by the way, actually got their start out in the beautiful state of California. They are changing how we spend money in America one day at a time, realizing that where we spend our dollars is where culture is going to thrive. If you 
are looking for businesses to support that share your values, check them out at publicsquare.com. And if you are a business owner of any kind, make sure you add your small business to Public Square to connect with customers who share your values too. And extra special thank you to the team over at Rough Greens. The more we are talking about nutrition lately, the more I'm realizing that processed food for human beings is just as scary as processed food for our doggies. Rough Greens calls the modern dog food industry dead food. And it's really not hard to understand why once you start looking into this yourself. So they have developed an additive, not a supplement, but something that you add on to your dog's existing diet to help make up for the nutritional deficits that exist in the kibble industry. It works just like a protein powder. You take a little scoop, you put it on top of your dog's existing food, and it is full of antioxidants, minerals, vitamins, everything to support your dog's health to help them be the best they can possibly be. They are offering you guys a free jumpstart trial pack to try at home with your doggies and take it from my puppy Liberty. She loves it and we use it every single day. If you go to roughgreens.com, R-U-F-F-Greens.com. I'm so glad, by the way, that there are companies that are trying to get to the actual truth of matters like this and in standing for women in general, just one of which happens to be my amazing friends over at Garnu. Garnu is the only period product company on the market that insists only women can menstruate. Thank you for that, by the way, Garnu, because we need a whole lot more of that. And their pads, their tampons, and their menstrual cup products are all 100% organic and completely non-toxic. I have noticed a huge change in my cycle since switching to Garnu products, and I cannot begin to recommend them enough to you, especially after we just found out that most leading tampon brands have arsenic and lead in them if you're buying them at Target or the grocery store. You can get a discount on your first order to Garnu if you click the link in the description of this video and please 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 embrace the same courage that they are in standing up for real womanhood in 2024 and beyond. 